Hi, all. Uh, as you know, this week is about uh, a little bit about researching in technical writing, and uh, including that is not just researching about technical topics, uh, but also researching about what technical documents might look like and what who our technical audiences might be. Right? So we're going to talk today about identifying, locating, and evaluating the source material just really quickly. Here we go. So <clears throat> think about research as part of your problem-solving approach, right? We're solving problems for specific audiences. So most technical writing begins with problems, not solutions. In other words, there is a problem your document needs to solve. Now you might have the technical solution to that problem, but your job as a technical writer is to solve the problem of what that document needs to be in order to get to solve that problem for that specific audience. So encountering a question that needs answering helps the researcher define a clear purpose. So our purposes are, are different depending on what problem we're trying to solve. Are we trying to actually solve the, the workplace problem through our research, right, to find out what we should do? Are we trying to solve rhetorical problems uh, about the audience or the document? So what is the problem this document will solve? Why is it needed? The specific audience shapes what research is necessary and how that research is presented and discussed. Who will use this document? What do they need? What do they already know? How will they use the document? When and where will they use the document? So think about something like signage. Uh, we need to know where that sign is going to be in relationship to the person who needs to notice and follow the direction of that signage. If that signage is on a, um, a machine that supposedly that person has already been trained to use, that signage does not need to walk them through every step of using the machine, but instead might just point out uh, common safety issues that happen with that machine, right? So part of what we need to know is not only what the actual problem is or problems are um, or how to solve them, but also what information our particular audience needs in order to solve those problems in their particular context. So audience interests, goals, and capabilities influence the format, organization, and sorts of information, or we're gonna call that research, that we consult. Writing for technical writing, research for technical writing pro projects um, grows from our planning stage and from our review stage. If you think about the problem-solving approach we've been discussing previously, right, uh, our projects generally start with some kind of plan, right? We have, we identify the problem, we identify the audience, uh, we have some ideas about genre and distribution, all these ideas that we need to consider before we actually put in all this work into actually writing the document. Uh, so in our planning, oftentimes, as we define and understand the problem, we recognize that we need to understand the problem more. We can research the problem itself. We need to identify the information you need to solve the problem. We can research the solution, right? Determine and understand the users of the document. We can research the audience. Understand the context in which the document will be used. We can research where and when this document will be used and we can identify the appropriate genre, style, and technological choices, right, depending on who our audience is, the context they're in, and what are their kind of industry or cultural expectations for what that document will look like. Um, you know, will people be more likely to use a YouTube video? Well, not if they don't have access to some kind of device to safely use in their context, right? Um, certainly there are places where you, you can't bring your phone into work, not just because it might distract you from your work, but also because it would be a safety issue. So in that case, that signage needs to look very different, or that instruction manual needs to look very different, right? So we can, these are things we can research, the different aspects of the bigger project we're working on. Of course, sometimes, we don't know everything we need to know just when we're planning. And as we write and review our work, we determine that we need additional information, right? And that might even happen towards the end of review when we're doing things like usability studies to see how people in the environment actually use these documents and whether they're working or not, 
right? In which case we might have to re go back to the drawing board and research some aspect of this problem uh, before moving forward with the completed document. So research requires you to identify what you need to know and know where or how to get the information you need. All right, so what do we need to know, but also where can we get that information? Now, sometimes, uh, depending on where you work, right, um, you are provided much of the information you need, right? Sometimes technical writers are provided with the information they are expected to communicate effectively for a specific purpose to a specific audience. Somebody says, hey, here's the information for my menu. Could you put this together for me in a way that is correct and visually appealing and will make sense and be organized and arranged in a way that makes sense to, to the diner, right? Um, so technical writers familiar with the purpose and audience may not need to conduct additional research in these situations, but research can make any project stronger, right? There may be new and innovative ways or interesting ways to think about putting together a menu um, that you know, just looking at some other menus in the area might bring to your attention. And that might be just things about kind of current design, uh, font size, especially if you haven't worked on that kind of project before, right? So any project can get better through research. Obviously the amount of research you need to do though will depend on what you know and what you need to know, right? Um, and we're going to talk about kind of two kinds of research. So finding and using existing research, what's work that's already been done. We could call those uh, when people actually do research and publish those results or share those results in some way, those are primary sources. When people discuss and analyze and interpret the work and studies that other people have done, we call those secondary sources. That's what a lot of academic articles look like. Uh, well, academic articles be primary or secondary. If primary if they're presenting a study they did, right? Secondary if they're talking about a number of different studies to investigate some theoretical or pedagogical perspective, right? And tertiary sources where we kind of move even farther away from uh, analysis and original study towards kind of an overview, the kind of information you might find in a general encyclopedia or in a general textbook. And of course, you can conduct your own research, and that is, that's part of what we do uh, all the time as, as academic writers. And so we can also think about how that is part of the technical writing environment as well. So identify research needs and sources. Research the workplace problem, solution, and context. So who understands the problem? Has the problem been studied? What is or are the solutions? Where and when does the problem occur? And where and when can it be solved? How will this document be pre present? How will this document present the solution? Right. So um, sometimes to get a solution, we just need to find the person in our organization who knows how to solve it. Right. Uh, sometimes our problems in our organization um, have multiple possible solutions, and one thing we might have to investigate is which solution would be the best for our particular workplace and our particular version of that workplace problem. We might be writing something like a proposal, right? We should, we should do this as an organization in order to uh, solve this problem, right? Um, analyze the context in your audience, your audience in their context. So is your audience made up of experts, technicians, executives, or non-specialists, right? Those are different kind of categories, general categories of people experts. So if we're writing uh, about an engineering problem for other engineers, we can write about it in a particular way because they're familiar, they're experts in that area. If we're writing about an engineering problem for technicians, we need to write about them, those problems within the context in which those technicians actually work. They know quite a bit about the practical job they do that applies perhaps uh, engineering ideas that they are not familiar with from a theoretical perspective, right? So how can we tailor the message for people who do the work that is technical, but don't necessarily understand the work behind why they do that work, right? Executives, these are generally speaking, uh, business people who may be really familiar with some aspects of their environment, their work environment, but are focused not on the technical or expert aspects, but instead on running the business, right? Uh, they have different needs depending on who they are. Were they engineers before? Were they technicians before? Uh, you know, what is their background in particular? 
they might even be non-specialists, right? And so a large uh, body of technical writing is actually taking rather technical information and producing it in a way that non-specialists, that's people that have no real, um, nothing beyond kind of common knowledge, uh, awareness of the information that we're communicating to them, right? Why it's necessary or what it actually means. So what do they know? What do they need to know? What interests them? Is there a way we can get them to pay attention to our message or to want to engage with our message? What is their work setting? How are their demo what are their demographic characteristics? How will they use this document? And discover expectations for form, style, and distribution. Does the organization have a style guide or similar publications, right? So a lot of larger organizations will actually have a style guide. This is kind of what our standard forms need, should look like. This is what we expect to find in a letter or a memo in these particular parts because it makes it easier for everybody then to find the information they need more quickly. We all follow the same basic rules. What are industry, of course, if they don't have a style guide, they may have similar publications, right? So maybe they don't have a style guide that says all of our reports of this kind look like this. But if you look at all the reports people write, they all look the same, right? Uh, and that's a way, right, that there's not necessarily a style guide but a way for us to find similar publications to guide our own work. What are industry standards for this type of publication, right? So if you're writing a white paper for education, you look at other white papers for education, you'll get a good idea of what kind of information and arrangement and style is expected in those documents. And there is nothing wrong with investigating what other writers have done with similar projects. Are there other writers who are composing similar documents, right? Those other writers might be people in your own organization who work on similar projects. Uh, and that's a great resource, especially if you're new to an organization, right? What, if, what are the people they are already doing? How can you add to or reinforce the, that work? Um, but also maybe in the, in the broader context of the whole field, kind of what are other writers doing when they do this kind of work for their organizations? Does it work? Is it effective? What, can, what kind of approach can I borrow from that work? What approaches do I want to avoid because I don't find it to be effective in that work, right? Ultimately, of course, how will the document be distributed? That's going to define a lot of what, you, what, what your actual presentation is going to look like, right? If what everybody's going to get is a book, then you don't have to worry about things like audio and visual representation. Of course, you could have some visuals in the book, right, which may be very important, um, but no videos, right, or recordings. Those things are all going to guide kind of our work as technical writers. So let's think about primary sources. What are primary sources? The primary sources are original materials on which other documents are based. They are the first formal appearance of results in print or electronic documents. They present information in original form, not evaluated, summarized, or interpreted. I mean, they may have sections that interpret the results, right? But they are not in, in and of themselves just evaluations or summary, summaries. Uh, they present original thinking, report discoveries, and share new ideas. There are lots of kinds of documents that count as primary sources, but a lot of those things you'll find archival and manuscript material, photographs, audio recordings, video recordings, films, journals, letters and diaries, speeches, scrapbooks, publications that are published in the moment. Think about like uh, newspaper articles, not editorials, but the articles that actually record like this is what happened, right? Um, government publications, oral histories, records of organizations, autobiographies and memoirs, printed ephemera, artifacts like clothing, costumes, furniture, all those things are primary sources. Uh, and then, of course, research data like public opinion polls. We can find those resources, right? People have published or archived primary sources, but we can also conduct primary research. So when we do primary research, we are the person who's creating primary sources. Uh, and that is really useful for a lot of techno technical writing projects. We can think about three very broad categories of research, qualitative, quantitative, and mixed method or method dependent research. So qualitative research is the idea that you're going to get um, what we call it fuzzy data. So information that isn't necessarily countable by math. It can be analyzed in ways that would be mathematical. Um, but we're trying to kind of get 
the quality responses from our the people we're working with. So uh, one of the most common ways for us to do this is through interviews, especially in the workplace, right? So interviews are typical means for workplace writers to acquire detailed information from people with the knowledge, expertise, and experience with the problem, context, or users. So if you have a workplace problem, you might talk to the people who are experiencing this, pro this problem, right? Um, and find out what do they think the problem is, what do they think we need to do to solve it, what do they need or understand, um, and by talking to many of these people who are affected by the problem, we might be able to find a better solution. We also might interview experts, right? talk to, right? it doesn't have to be a formal interview, we have these kind of fixed questions, where you just have a conversation with the expert that says, okay, this is the problem that's been identified, uh, you know, what do you think we should do about this, right? Or when we get the job, a lot of times we're talking to the person who's hiring us who is trying to explain from their perspective what that problem is, right? So um, getting all of that qualitative research gives us a bunch of different perspectives on the same problem will allow us to hopefully uh, find the solutions we need to create a document they can use to solve their problems. Focus groups are a, an extended version of a, an interview. They're group interviews usually conducted with six to 15 participants. And they're designed to generate not only answers to your own questions, but conversations amongst the group members, right? Um, because sometimes people will share different information or have different reactions when they hear other people who are like them talking about the issue, right? So instead of just interviewing every worker on the line uh, individually, we might invite an entire shift in and say, okay, you know, today for the first two hours of work, instead of working, you're going to sit in here. We're just going to have some coffee and talk about some problems you guys see on the line while you're working, right? And from that conversation with the men and women who work on the line, you might be able to identify very different perspectives on the, on the problems that you might not get just from single interviews. Of course, you can do quantitative research. Quantitative research is research that we can analyze mathematically. Um, surveys are kind of the most common tool that you'll use as a technical writer. Uh, and that's where we want to find out like, how we can get quick response about how easy it is or if to use something or how effective the thing is um, that we're testing out, right? So it's a great way for evaluating services, testing new ideas, and getting user feedback by collecting answers to a series of questions. Um, of course, surveys can also collect qualitative research, just like during interviews, you can ask them some questions that are kind of yes, no, or likely, not likely at all kinds of questions, right? We can collect qualitative or quantitative research in different ways, but generally speaking, uh, through surveys, we collect mostly quantitative and through interviews, mostly qualitative research. Uh, mixed method or method dependent research has to do uh, with either if we designed an interview that actually had a series of questions that were qualitative and then a series of, of questions that were just quantitative, right? I just want to have a yes, no, or Likert scale questions, right? We could do the same thing on a survey, right? In that case, they become mixed method. In other words, they involve both qualitative and quantitative. Method dependent means it depends on your approach to that particular uh, research tool. So we can think of a survey or an interview or a focus group as a research tool. Um, and so, of course, it depends what you do as to whether it is qualitative, quantitative, or mixed method. So a couple of the things you might think about in the technical writing situation is observation. Um, a researcher can observe a situation, a location, or a process to understand and evaluate it, right? We could actually go to a workplace and watch people working in order to see how they navigate problems in their workplace. Inspection is then uh, like a really intense observation, more active, requiring the research to directly interact with the environment. So instead of observing other people working in, inspection might involve the writer, him or herself, actually using the tool um, or working in the, in the environment in which the problem is occurring. Experiments allow you to gather information without expectation according to a clear plan, right? So we could set up an experiment um, for this particular solution and then have people actually do it and we observe them 
right? Um, the information can then be analyzed, reported, and utilized as needed. So these are different approaches to research for doing our own research as technical writers. And you can think about one form of experiment that we'll talk about later, well two, are accessibility and usability studies. Those are experiments through which we're going to see how easily or difficult um, it is for people to actually use our documents to solve the problem we're trying to solve. All right, those are experiments, okay? Um, secondary sources describe, interpret, analyze, and evaluate primary sources. They comment on and discuss the evidence and ideas discussed in primary sources. They're usually created after the event or information to which they refer, and they often rely upon primary sources, combining them with other sources or applying them to new situations. Think about this as a lot of the kinds of uh, resources, the optional readings I'm providing for you in the course. They include things like journal articles that comment on or analyze other people's research. They're books that interpret or analyze. It's political commentary, right? Talking about like, this is what I see, you know, all these things actually mean. Biographies, remember in this primary autobiographies, people writing their own stories. In the secondary sources, biographies, people writing other people's stories. Um, a lot of dissertations, right, at least uh, or master's theses, we'll have that section to literature review. That is a perfect example of a secondary source, right? You're trying to pull together all this information and analyze it uh, to, to draw, kind of find themes and connections across that information. Newspaper editorials and opinion pieces, criticism of literature, artworks, or music, right? These are just some examples. So how is this helpful for a technical writer? Well, a lot of solutions to problems have been identified in primary source studies, and then they are critiqued perhaps at the secondary level, right? By looking at those critiques, you can save yourself a lot of time and effort in trying to look at all these different, trying to identify all these different primary studies, and instead find a secondary source that says, here's a bunch of primary studies that tried to solve this problem, Here's the one we think works best and why, right? Um, it could save you a lot of time to start with secondary sources and work your way back to primary sources that might be useful. Tertiary sources are sources that index, abstract, organize, compile, or digest other sources. They're often reference materials and textbooks whose chief purpose is to list, summarize, or simply repackage ideas or other information. They're usually not credited to a particular author, right? So think about something like an encyclopedia. There's not, uh, in a general encyclopedia, there's not usually an author on each um, entry. Now, if you get a really specific kind of encyclopedia of 20th century American literature, right, it might actually be a collection of secondary sources. But we're talking more about tertiary sources than those more general things. Think about Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a great example of a tertiary source. It doesn't actually do new research, like a primary source. It doesn't really talk about what that research means, which would be a secondary source. Instead, it just kind of collects and gathers that information and gives it to us as, as readers. Uh, so they include various documents such as dictionaries and encyclopedia, encyclopedias, which may be secondary, almanacs, fact books, Wikipedia, bibliographies, uh, which is lists of sources, right? They may be secondary if they include interpretive uh, information. Uh, directories, guidebooks, manuals, handbooks, and textbooks, which also may be secondary if they have, once again, um, it depends how specific textbooks are, right? If they're a general resource introduction kind of level, or if they are books we use for really specific uh, courses, as well as indexing and abstracting sources, right? So abstracts are kind of where they just say, like, this article is about, right? That's what an abstract does. And indexes are where those are organized in some way, so you can save you the time of having to read a bunch of articles. You can instead use that index, which gives you a really short abstract um, to see if those things relate to your work, right? So part of uh, doing research, though, is, of course, evaluating the quality of those sources. So the real trick for writers and researchers is not just finding sources, but evaluating them for trustworthiness and accuracy to ensure they are using reliable sources, right? doesn't do you any good to find a bunch of sources that aren't accurate because then your work that you derive from those sources is not accurate, right? So when evaluating research sources and presenting your own research, be careful to critically evaluate the authority 
who is writing this and for what purpose, right? Uh, where is it being published, those kinds of things, authority. Content is what is being presented, um, both does it seem factual and is it reinforced uh, with things like citations, right? Is it connected to the wider conversation around that issue? And purpose in the material, right? Is this something that's published by an industry that wants to promote the use of its products? Um, or is the purpose uh, to take an external view of something, right? There are different kind of issues of reliability we can look at. So there's clearly a connection between where you find sources and the likelihood of their being reliable. So please make sure you pay attention uh, not only to who the author is and what they're saying and what they're trying to accomplish, but also um, what publications present this information and are those publications in and of themselves reliable. As we're locating sources, of course, we can locate sources in our workplace, right? Who are the exp experts? Who are the technicians? Who are the executives? Who are the other writers there? And what, who are the other employees there, right? One of our greatest resources as a workplace writer is the other people in our workplace. We can also look at current documents in our workplace, right? A lot of times we'll see that uh, documents across an organization may duplicate effort. And if you can find that effort already duplicated, you can save yourself and the company a lot of uh, time and money and effort uh, by consolidating that work. Of course, nowadays we all look for things first and foremost on the internet, right, through search engines would lead us to things like websites. Uh, be aware, I'm sure most of you are, that .com or .biz or .net are generally um, sources whose purpose is to sell or present information in a way that benefits that particular organization or product. Um, so if you go to a company's website, it's probably going to be a .com, and that's going to present positive information about their company, right? Um, .org then includes some organizations that might be presenting positive information about themselves, but also includes um, perhaps information that looks as an external organization at other issues. .edu relates to um, education, of course, particularly higher education in most cases. Uh, the UL, because a lot of um, K-12 schools will have a .us at the end, their government um, sites. And .gov is your primary federal government sites. A lot of reliable information on those sites, right? Uh, be aware that there's a difference between blogs, which are web logs or diaries, basically. That's how they started. But there are blogs that are written by experts, and there are blogs that are written by casual users. You have to be aware of who is writing what they're writing and why they're writing it and why it's published on a blog on the internet and not in a reliable publication. Doesn't mean that information isn't useful, it just means it's not useful on its own. We need to be able to verify that information. Uh, Wiki is very much the same way. So something like Wikipedia can have a lot of really useful information, but because wikis are written by the users who use them, it means some of those people aren't authorities in their area to write about these things and that things are changeable in ways that traditional publications are not. So once again, it doesn't mean the information is bad, it just means we need to verify it. So things like blogs and wikis, uh, things like dot-com sites are things we generally will not cite in academic work. Now it doesn't mean we can't reference it for ideas, but they are things we need to be really careful about uh, and find reliable sources that give us similar information in order to use that information in our work as academic writers. Now, technical writers, it depends on your industry. There may be blogs and wikis that are related specifically to the industry in which you're working that are some of the best information you can find. Uh, and you might have, some of you might be writing for .com websites, right? Uh, then we have kind of two other kinds of sources, and these are things we relate more to traditional research, databases. So if you go to our university library site or the university library site where you're currently working, 
you will see a list of databases to which you have access and databases are just collections of quality information that you can search kind of the same way you might go to the library traditionally i don't know how many of you are this old and actually look at a card catalog to find different uh different books about a similar subject or by a similar author these of course are electronic databases that allow you to search across uh, a ridiculous number of research material uh, articles and chapters and government documents all kinds of things related to that are digital archives which uh, increasingly we see a push in the digital humanities to digitize archival information archives are collections of information usually are built around one person or one institution um, where a lot of information has been collected that is without analysis still and so they present opportunities for you to do that kind of research uh, so those two things key obviously we can still go to traditional libraries and archives for for help uh, if you need to research something and you're at nsu there is uh, there are research librarians who are who can help you even at a distance right uh, you go to their website and they have the contact information for research librarians and of course, we're going to look at other media as well, right? We can no longer pretend like things like TV and radio, uh, YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, whatever, doesn't pre present uh, useful information. Of course they do, right? Um, so we might be working on a documentary. That's another kind of uh, media that we might be watching, right? Uh, to get information rather than just reading something to get information. So depending our project right our research can look very different and come from very different kinds of sources it's also good to think about these things we talk about our research on the, in the academic side when you think about organizing your research um, obviously take notes all right just underlining or highlighting uh, reminds you to go back and look at that information again but it doesn't really remind you what that information was about so you're it's forcing you to do that work twice you take really good notes that are focused by your purpose, right? Whatever that workplace problem or audience or rhetorical problem is you're looking at. Um, then you already have your notes and you, you have to spend less time reviewing the original article again, right? And instead spend time reviewing your notes, right? Moving your own ideas and your own interpretations of your research forward in your project. So after you take your notes, reread them, reorganize them by putting similar information together. Working with your notes involves regrouping them by topic instead of source. So this is a great advice for you if you're working on an academic project. When you get to your literature review, you should never have kind of paragraph by paragraph, source by source. Instead, we should be grouping together things that talk about uh, similar approaches and similar issues. Uh, even if right, different some sources might only refer to one issue and some sources might be spread out over several different issues. So regroup your notes by reshuffling maybe index cards or color coding or using symbols to code in a notebook, whatever works for you. Um, if you take digital notes, you can actually you know, cut and paste them around. Just make sure you keep their original um, attribution, right, where they came from with that as you move it around right so you know when you want to go back and actually get the actual source material you can look at it one more time if you need to review the topics of your newly grouped notes if the topics do not help solve your problems you may need to do additional research or rethink your plan right so sometimes we find out when we're looking at this that we don't have the research we think we have or the research we actually need so as you add to your research keep going back and reviewing how this additional information fits in with your project so when are you done researching? Well, there's two ways to be done. You're either done when you feel like you have enough information to, to complete the project, or you're done because you've run out of time to collect more information and you have to complete the project because of a deadline. So we wanna balance that so that it's more of the first where we actually feel like we have everything we need to complete the project and not the, oh no, you know, we have to complete a project even though we're lacking information. Using and documenting sources. So uh, we'll talk more about documenting sources as we move towards the end of the semester. Um, but just be aware that, as you know, documenting sources properly shows that you have used them in an ethical manner. Give credit to others for their ideas, and you make clear that your readers, uh, to your readers, how you have used sources in your document. Right? We should recognize what is your work, what is your ideas, and what is somebody else's. Right. 
Um, be aware of the systems of documentation and formatting used in your field. That's going to look very different depending on your field. Uh, for this class, uh, traditionally you guys tend to write in MLA or APA, and I'm fine with either. Um, some ideas about quoting. We don't quote very often in, in technical work unless we're writing a, a, a really detailed research report or proposal. Because part of our job as technical writers is to simplify everything and to bring everything, make everything concise and cohesive and bring everything down, basically. So uh, we would only use brief quotes, if at all. Um, and make sure we only use quotes to fill holes in our writing, not because we don't know what needs to be said. Right? Uh, paraphrasing allows us instead to capture author, the author's intent and information in our own words. Um, we have to make sure we understand the original thoroughly, so we are rep rep reproducing the idea fully, right? But it allows us to take maybe the idea of an entire document and say, this is what they were saying, right? Um, and give them a citation because it's still their ideas, but not waste a lot of time quoting and overanalyzing things if that's not necessary for our document. And in technical writing, it's oftentimes not. Uh, summarizing, right, is abbreviating information without compromises, meaning we have to make sure we cover all the points made in the original. So, um, and one, one kind of writing that we'll talk about is the technical summary. We'll get to that, and it's the idea of um, the executive summary is something that maybe executives, we do for executives, so they don't have to read the entire piece, but they need to fully understand it, right? Um, and it allows us to take not just like the main idea, like we might with paraphrasing, but to actually summarize all the ideas in a really tight, compact format uh, that saves people time while still giving them the information they need. Just really quickly about plagiarism and technical writing. Plagiarism is defined simply as the act of passing off as one's own the ideas or writings of someone else, right? If you pretend like the work you're doing is yours and you've borrowed it without attribution, you are plagiarizing. Writers are guilty of plagiarism when they submit documents that borrow ideas, structure, organization, or wording from other sources without properly documenting it. Right? Uh, we can and should do research, but we can and should show that we've done that research in a variety of ways. It's going to look very different depending on uh, what kinds of documents you're working on. But when you're working on longer things like reports, and you'll see these on government websites, um, they oftentimes have citations in them and work cited at the end. When you're creating a workplace document, it might not have all those citations, but it's also because we're not using a lot of external research, right? We're doing a lot of our own research, kind of what we figured out needs to be done, right? So think about that as you're doing your work and the different kinds of projects require different kinds of documentation because they require different kinds of research. Now, using organizational templates, ideas and wording, as well as general knowledge do not typically require documentation. But these practices should be discussed as part of the development of any writing pro project. So if all the memos in your area, in, in your organization, are set up in the same way, you can borrow that structure or the organization of that memo uh, without problem. In the same way, if your company has a common slogan or a common description of a position, you would not need to rewrite that wording every time you used it. That is what we call common knowledge to that context. There's also general knowledge, which are things that everybody kind of commonsensically knows, the kind of information you would find in something like Wikipedia or an encyclopedia uh, in general or a textbook. In which case, you wouldn't have to cite that because it's what we call general knowledge. People generally know it, uh, so you wouldn't need to cite it. And of course, you don't have to cite your own research. Uh, if you, convert, if you cre conduct primary research, you won't cite that. You're just saying it, and people know it's your work because it's your work. Okay? So I know it's a lot. If you have questions, contact me. I'm always here to help. Thanks.